Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about um, how I can use a rubric to earn a high grade on assignments. I've realized recently that although I've been using a lot of rubrics and providing them to students ahead of time and then providing the graded rubrics, not all students understand the point of rubrics, why they're used, and how students can use them um, before the assignments are turned in, and then also how they can use graded rubrics to increase grades on future assignments. So today we're going to talk about what is a rubric, why do we use rubrics, I'm going to introduce you to rubrics. We're going to talk about how to use rubrics to increase your grades and how to understand the graded rubrics, like I said. So what is a rubric? A rubric is a table or a chart that provides specific assignment grading requirements. There's usually some criteria. There's different categories that tell you either points or percent of how much you'll get for, different, uh, for hitting different standards. So why do your professors use rubrics? We use rubrics because it clarifies the expectations of what we need you to do for an assignment. It specifies what work earns what grade. And it makes, because of that, it makes the grading much more objective and more consistent across students and across assignments. That's really important for things like papers or presentations that sometimes have a hard time having um, being graded objectively, right? And the other part is because we, we use rubrics for you so that you can use the information to increase your grades. So I'm going to introduce you to rubrics. So hello, rubrics. There are some very particular things that all rubrics generally have in common. One, um, it looks like a table generally okay it can be set up different ways but there are rows and columns the first column is usually the criteria what you need to do for the assignment and that usually for mine anyway come directly from the assignment directions okay a lot of times rubrics have titles this one does not um, but this one has what they call levels of achievement and it named them excellent, good, poor, no evidence, right? So that means that if you hit all of the things in the excellent column, that you're going to get the highest grade possible for this particular assignment. These are for um, discussions. This is an online, this is not one of mine, but it's an online rubric that somebody used uh, for their discussions. Okay, so the, criteria, the first criteria is initial post, original thought or contribution. And under the excellent level of achievement, you can earn one point if it's a well-developed if the well-developed ideas, including introduction of new ideas, stimulates discussion, and there's no mechanical issues. You can have a good or half a point if the ideas are mostly well-developed, but new ideas are not introduced into the discussion, or they do not stimulate the discussion. Right, so. What this is showing is that in order to earn the highest amount of points, you need to look in the category under excellent for this particular rubric. So initial post, original thought or contribution, in order for me to get the full point that I should get, I need to really think about this before I type this, and I need to explain my ideas, right? Well-developed ideas, and I need to bring in something new. It can't be something straight from the textbook or the or or PowerPoints or whatever, because it says introduce introduction of new ideas. So I need to do a little bit of research on this one, right? I have to stimulate the discussion, so I can't write something which is similar to what everybody else would write. I have to come up with some new way of writing it. The the next criteria is initial post, development of thought, right? And so for each of these criteria, the, that row tells you what you need to do to earn the highest grade, what you can do to earn uh, kind of a middle grade, 0.5, what you can do to earn a poor grade or 0.25 points, right? Or no evidence, meaning it wasn't in there or the professor didn't, didn't know, didn't see it, and so you've got zero points on that. And what happens is when these are all clicked on, particularly in Canvas, which is what we use at Montclair State, 
it adds everything up and then your grade is added up. So going back to parts of a rubric. This is a rubric from um, my creative arts class, my creative arts and counseling class for the group presentation. So the title of the rubric is Grading for Group Presentation. I'm not very creative with my titles. Uh, there are three criteria that I've put for you to look at. And there are more than that, but I'm, I'm trying to fit all of this on a slide, right? So the first one is organize the criteria, which come directly from the assignment directions, are organized, prepared. The second criteria was actually a creative arts experience. I didn't use the word actually, but the third criteria is taught us something, right? So if I look at that column of criteria, I know if I that those are some of the things that are going to be used to grade the presentation. If I take the first criteria, organized and prepared, and I go across the row, now I don't generally name the columns of the ratings of like the grade. I use points. And you'll also notice that some of the rows, like organized, prepared, really only have a couple of criteria, two criteria before you get to zero. So it goes five points, three points, zero points. But was a creative arts experience, can, you can earn up to 10 points for that. And then you can earn eight points, five points, zero points. The reason, not all rubrics have to be an exact perfect table. That is a misnomer. And so I don't really want organized and prepared to be worth the same amount of points as the actual presentation of a creative experience, right? So let's say they mess something up. I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense to me as a professor that those are worth the same amount of points. So I have made that a different a point category, all right? So for organized and prepared to earn five points, it says to earn the full five points, the group is completely prepared and has obviously rehearsed or discussed the lesson plan. The present presentation was well organized with each group member contributing equally. That would earn the group five points. They would earn three points if group members had some confusion during the lesson or they did not have some of the materials or was not well organized. So if you had one of those, right, that's the or, you could still get three points. But if there was a lack of organization, members did not equally contribute, materials were missing, those kinds of things, then you would earn zero points. Now I do have some leeway in between that. So let's say there was a little bit of issue in the beginning around um, who would speak first, but after that, everything kind of fell into line. So instead of getting three points, right, I might give four because I think, well, you started off a little shaky, but then you pulled it together, right? So there is some leeway in that. And if you get something like that, um, you're just going to have to look back at the rubric and we'll talk about that later. But anyway, right? So at the end of the row, it tells you the number of points. If you're looking at a rubric before it's graded, the number of points possible for that criteria. So organized, prepared, if you go all the way to the right where it says points, it's worth five points. Was a creative arts experience is worth 10 points and taught us something was worth five points. So if this was the whole um, rubric, then, then the assignment was the, is then totally worth 20 points. So how can you use rubrics to increase your grade? Well, there's a couple of things. One is the rubrics are the expectations of what your professor wants to get an A, for you to get an A. And they're hopefully pretty clear. So if you read those expectations, if you read the, the, the column with the highest points, right? then you'll have a, an understanding of what you really need to make sure you do before you turn the assignment in. The set, and, and that also acts like a checklist, right? Okay, I, the rubric says, on the rubric, let's say it says, has five sources from the last five years, da 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 earns 10 points for that. And you go through your reference list and you realize you only have four sources from the past five years, you need to get another one or you're going to lose points. So it's also a checklist of when you've completed the assignments that helps you on 
helps make sure that you're following the directions. So you can use that to review your work before you turn it in. You can also use rubrics from graded assignments to then make sure you don't make that same mistake in the next assignment, even across classes, because we have a lot of papers in our program. And so if you're looking at the rubrics and looking at the feedback from your professors, you can change, how, change your writing to the better, even across courses. Most students, once they get their grade, they're like, okay, that's great, next class. But if you really take a look at those, you can actually make sure your grades get higher and higher throughout the program. All right, so I'm going to give you an example. This is a rubric from my um, supervision and consultation course. <laughs> um, it's a clinical mental health course. And the title of this one is LPC Meeting Rubric. So the, this group of students, um, that class, they choose their own assignments. Anyway, this group of students was able to go to a licensure board meeting. Um, and so I, ha I created a rubric for that. The criteria, there's three criteria that they attended the meeting, that the student completed the assignment letter. They had a letter that they had to do. And the summary is written professionally. And they have proof of completion. So attending the meeting, it's 30 points if they attended the meeting, if they were on time and stayed the entire meeting. That's pretty clear. You have to be there, you have to be there on time, and you have to stay until it's over, right? They only earn 10 points if they arrive late or left early. So that shows you that for 30 points of a 75-point assignment, it was really important to me as a professor that people show up on time and stay the entire time, okay? So that's one thing that somebody has to think about. Well, if I, if I have something, if I'm not able to stay for the whole meeting, then maybe I need to pick another assignment or I need to talk to my professor because I'm going to lose 20 points right off the top of the assignment for that. That's important. St the next criteria is student completed the assignment, letter summary is written professionally. Okay. So for 35 points, the letter or summary that they had to do was written professionally. There were no grammar errors. It was clear, and it followed the directions of the assignment. So as a student, I would then go back to the assignment and look at the directions of how to write that letter or summary to make absolutely sure I'm doing all of those. If I do all of those, I get 35 points. I lose a significant amount of points if I have grammar errors or I didn't follow the directions of the assignment. So it's 35 points if I do it right. I only get 15 points if I have grammar errors or, or I don't, or not and, I, follow, I don't follow the directions. So again, it, not only does it show you how important that is, so the, so the going to the meeting is 30 points out of 75, which is important, and the letter is 35 points. So those two things together are extremely important to your professor. Those are priority things that you're going to absolutely make sure are done. You're going to put more effort into that, right? And then the proof of completion is 10 points. So you have to upload, probably to Canvas, the letter of summary and proof of sending the letter or presenting the summary. So you had to, they had to provide some type of proof. If they missed one or the other, they only got 5 points. If they didn't upload it, they only got 10. So it was obvious that while I wanted proof of completion, the actual assignment and attending the meeting were the majority of points. So as a student, I would absolutely make sure that since those had the highest numbers, that I would pay particular attention to those. Let me give you another example. This is for a, a literature review for a, a career counseling. This is only part of the rubric, right? So the first criteria is APA style. The second is the definition of the population. The students had to pick um, a population that they wanted to work with and determine the career needs, write a literature review around that. And the next criteria is population career needs, right? So the APA style is worth 10 points, the definition of the population is worth 15, and the population career needs are worth 15. Okay. So looking at that, I know that APA style is important, but if I miss one or two, I'll go down to I'll only miss a few points. But if I don't clearly define the population seeking to assist that we're seeking to assist through this project, I could lose up to five points on the assignment. That's something I really need to pay attention to because that's more points lost, right? So what you want to do is you want to look at the highest points. So APA style, 
10 points if paper adheres to APA style guidelines, sixth edition. Okay, definition of population, 15 points. If I clearly define the population I'm seeking to assist through this project, I've got to absolutely make sure I really do define it. And I don't just say middle school students, right? Population career needs, 15 points. Clearly defines the career needs of this population supported by significant recent research. So if I say, hey, middle school students, they need some career help. They don't know what they're going to do, and they have to make a decision if they're going to go to Votech school, if they're going to go into like an honors program or a regular program or whatever. So that's what they need. And if I write it that way, but I don't produce evidence for that, if it's like my idea or if I don't have references and, and literature to back it up, I'm not going to earn my 15 points. I'm definitely going to lose that. Okay. Now, the bottom part of this rubric has three more. This is the same rubric. Career theory, program website objectives. They had to take the, the um, literature view and turn it basically into a website for students to, to be able to utilize. So instead of having like a binder to use <clears throat> as, as a counselor, you would have a website for them to go to. Um, and then graduate level writing, okay? So the career theory is also worth 15 points. Well, that's also an important part of the assignment. So if I go back and look at this, the definition of the population, the population career needs, and the career theory are all worth 15 points. That means Dr. Renfro and Michelle thinks that those are more important, and I'm probably going to spend a lot more time in the paper on those particular areas, right? So for career theory, I earn 15 points if I clearly state the one career counseling theory that will be utilized and why this is an appropriate theory to utilize with cited professional literature, not the textbook. So if I go back and look at that section of my paper and realize that I've chosen two theories, then I know I'm going to lose points because it was clearly states the one career counseling theory. Or if I choose a theory that's that's a counseling theory but not a career counseling theory, again, I know I'm going to lose points. So the idea of this rubric is to help you understand by the amount of points the criteria is worth, how important it is in that paper or assignment, and also the things that you make sure you have in that assignment so that you can get the highest points possible. Right? So if we look at program website objectives, which are worth 10 points, this is still significant, it says clearly defines a minimum of four specific measurable objectives, specific, apparently I was into specific, to the population's needs as cited in the literature review. So I go, that means I have to go back to the literature review and make sure that I have the career needs in there and I can take from there to determine the objectives of the website. Again, I look at the paper and I realize I only have two objectives, so I'm definitely going to lose points for that. Or they're not measurable objectives. I say this website will give people information, give middle school students information on how to choose a high school. Well, that's not really measurable. Like, how do I know that they're going to get that information? How, like, what type of information, right? Versus the middle school students will complete an assessment two assessments to help them determine which high school they choose, right? That's a clear objective of the website. And then the last criteria is graduate level writing, 10 points, right? Generalized principles of writing are adhered to. There's unbiased language, the ideas are clear, they're completed and well organized, and professional references are used. So go back over it. Biased language could be things like saying, like, uh, things that would sound like they come from like People Magazine or um, a very excited new, uh, news source, right? Middle school students must choose a high school and therefore school counselors have to provide them with this information. Well, not really. At the end of middle school, versus at the end of middle school, students um, are are determining which high school they're going to attend, 
So for school counselors providing information on this will help these students make that decision, right? That's a completely different tone of voice in that, right? Now, I know that the whole assignment is worth 75 points because at the bottom right of the rubric, it's a 75 points, okay? Now, I'm going to show you or talk to you about how to read a graded rubric. So this was what we just did with the career the literature review, which is a paper, is how to look at that rubric, determine what's more important based on how many points and how to get the highest points, right? That's, that's how you use that to make sure that what you're turning in is going to have the highest grade possible, okay? But once you get a paper back with a graded rubric, how do you actually know why you got that grade? And how do you use that for future assignments? So this is a midterm and final exam rubric from my theories class. Um, and I, the before is what's listed in the assignment in Canvas. So it gives you the criteria and each set of ratings, right? So looking at this rubric, I've got graduate level writing worth 14 points. That's interesting. That's kind of important. I've got client's basic background worth five points. Well, I'm not going to spend too much time on the basic background, right? Because it's only worth five points. I'm going to absolutely make sure my paper, my paper has no APA errors, is well organized, has no grammar issues, and has really good graduate writing because that's worth 14 points. So that is apparently very important to that teacher. Next criteria is explanation of the issue from the client's point of view. All right, so that's worth 10 points. Okay. That's kind of important too. So I need to have an objective explanation of the issue from the client's point of view, and it needs to be free of bias. So I can't say something like, this lazy client is coming in, right, because he's unemployed and he's just given up, he doesn't want to work. That's okay, but that's not really objective, right? It's not objective at all. Versus the client is entering counseling because he's been unemployed and he's trying to find a job. But he is having issues around uh, frustration and depression, maybe, right? Very different. Now, the conceptualization of the client's case from the theoretical framework is worth 25 points. I'm going to spend a significant amount of time and a significant amount of my paper on something that's worth 25 points. So that's how, when I'm looking at that assignment, I'm going to make a decision on where to spend my time and how much effort I put into each part of the paper. So if the client's basic background is only worth five points, I'm probably only going to make it about a paragraph or so. If I end up making that a whole page, then I'm taking away from the amount uh, that I need for the conceptualization, which is worth 25 points, which is significant. Now, in order to earn that 25 points, I have to have a full case conceptualization. I have to have an explanation of the case. I have to have what is happening in the case, integrating the theoretical framework. It has to be specific to the client. It has to be clear that, that I understand that I've studied the theory and understood and, and the references and understand them, right? So that means that I have to make sure that I need to explain things, but very specific to the case and not just throw out terminology, right? I've got to really give them a understanding. So here's the client. This is what I think is going on. This is why I think it's going on. Here's some examples from the case, right? And I'm going to spend a lot more time on that, remember, because it's worth more points. Now, this is an example of a graded um, rubric for the same assignment. At the top, and this is Canvas, so at the top, the grade was 84 out of 100, so it's 100 points. So that means that that case conceptualization, which was 25 points, is one-fourth of that grade. So you better 
believe I'm going to spend more time on that. But okay, I got it back. I thought I did what I was supposed to do, and I didn't. Crud. So let me look at the criteria. When you see the, the graded rubric in Canvas, you're not going to see every single, you're going to see the criteria, but you're not going to see every single letter of grading. You're going to see the points that you have and the explanation that was in that box for those points. Okay, so for graduate level writing, I earned 14 out of 14 points, which means I had two or less APA or grammar issues. It was well organized, well written on the graduate level writing, and included appropriate vocabulary. Fabulous. But if I go down to the case conceptualization, this is strange because it says 20 out of 25 points, but no details. So I'm going to go back to the original rubric. Now the way the case conceptualization rubric goes, it goes 25 points, 13 points, 7 points. But Dr. Renfro Michelle gave me 20 points, which means I'm somewhere between 25 and 13 points. I didn't do enough, have enough errors to lose that many points, right? But I did have, enough, have some. So what I would do at that point is read 25 points, which is full conceptualization, explanation of the case, what's happening in the case, integrating theoretical framework, and 13 points, full conceptualization, explanation of the case, what is happening in the case, integrating the model, but missing some pieces of the theory base. Hmm. So I'm somewhere between those, which means I've got to go look at my comments from the teacher, which will tell me exactly why I ended up with that grade. Okay. Now, reading the comments and understanding this, if I have another case conceptualization to do, for graduate level writing, I got 14 out of 14 points. For the basic background, I got 5 out of 5 points. For the explanation of the issue, I got 10 out of 10 points. For the conceptualization, I got 20 out of 25 points. For the cultural considerations, I got 5 out of 5. And for the discussion on ethical principles, I got 5 out of 5. So right now, I know that to do another case conceptualization, I need to up my game on for this, if I do my, for my final exam, because this is for the midterm and the final, I'm assuming this is a midterm, I know that I need to do something to increase my conceptualization score, because that, out of these criteria so far, that's the one that's low. So that's the one I need to make sure my final exam goes up. The last part of the same rubric, measurable goals from the client's point of view, three out of six points. It says is missing one of the goals or one of the goals is not measurable. So I need to go back into my paper and take a look so that I make sure that on my final I get all of my points. And I un if I understand why I missed points, I can understand how not to make that same mistake in my next paper. Measure measurable goals you have for the client, zero out of six points. Holy cow, I missed those completely. They're either either missing, the goal is not measurable, or the goals show a high amount of bias. Meaning, the guy has to get a job or else kind of thing, right? That would be not an appropriate goal. So I've got to go back to my paper and to my comments and figure out why I got zero points because that's losing six points is significant. And I want to make sure that in my final exam, I have those six points. The next criteria is short discussion on three techniques and methods. I got four out of six. So I am probably missing one of the required techniques or methods, or there was some issue with explanation and connection to the theory base and the whole conceptualization. So again, looking at that, I say, oh, I missed points there. I don't want to miss those on the final exam. So I need to go back into my paper, figure out why I missed those points. And if I don't understand that, I need to email my teacher before the final exam. Three types of professional information you need. I got six out of six points. Hallelujah. And the references. I did great on my references. I got 12 out of 12 points. So I got 84. I earned 84 out of 100 points. But I have very specific places that I now know I need to improve upon before the final exam. If I do that, my final exam grade is probably going to be much, much higher. So by understanding the rubric and connecting the rubric to 
the um, feedback from your professor and then asking your professor additional questions if needed, you're able to use the rubric very specifically to increase your grade in the next paper. You can also do this across courses. So while papers are different, the APA is the same, the idea of following directions is the same, the understanding of case conceptualization is probably similar. So by understanding what you missed in a paper, even a final exam, and really taking a look at that, you can make sure that in your next class, when you have another paper, you don't make those same mistakes again. There's, I have to tell you, there's nothing more frustrating for a professor to spend an incredible amount of time grading papers and giving detailed feedback only to have the next paper turned in by the same student have the same errors. So that's something you need to think about too, is the whole point of this is to help you learn and grow, which will help you get better grades, right? So I have a couple of resources there if you like. Um, otherwise, you, um, hopefully this was helpful. If you have any questions, um, please email me or post them in, in the questions to professor. Thank you.